The ever-growing genre of true crime is more popular now than it has ever been before. There are hundreds of documentaries offering insights into the minds of the world's most notorious killers or shedding new light to still unsolved cases. These documentaries might not be as traditionally scary as the latest blockbuster horror movie, but the real-life horrors told by the people involved can be just as chilly. These are five more scary true crime documentaries you have to see. Number five. Even before filming began, many suspected Robert Durst was responsible for his wife's murder, along with the murder of two other people he had close connections to. But Durst had always claimed he was innocent. The Jinx is about a man hoping to prove himself innocent in the eyes of the media to crimes many suspected he committed between 40 and 15 years previously. Kathleen Durst went missing from her home in New York in 1982. Robert had been violent towards her throughout their marriage and they had been fighting the night she disappeared. Robert claimed he'd driven her to a train station where she'd planned to catch a train to Manhattan where they had a second apartment. He also claimed he'd called her once she had arrived and then that he had a visitor at the door. During the investigation, he changed his story multiple times and evidence found at his home only raised more suspicions. However, despite multiple investigations in the years since the disappearance and Kathleen's death being listed as the time she disappeared, Durst was never charged for her murder and would continue to claim he was innocent. The next murder linked to this apparently jinxed man was the 2000 execution-style killing of Susan Berman. She was one of Durst's close friends, and it's alleged his accomplice in covering up Kathleen's murder. It wasn't until 2001 that he was finally arrested, but this time for a different killing, the dismembered body of his elderly neighbor, Morris Black, who was found floating in a nearby bay. Durst confessed to killing Morris and disposing of her body, but claimed it had been in self-defense and he was found not guilty. Despite the verdict, family and friends of the three women, as well as anyone following the case, suspected he was guilty. The jinx goes through the circumstantial evidence tying Durst to each murder. He was interviewed for hours, explaining what he claimed had really happened, and continuing to argue his innocence until one bathroom break when he forgot about a microphone where he allegedly confessed to the killings. The case is currently in court, in part due to the controversial confession in the documentary's final episode. Number 4 Wild Wild Country is a six-part series that explored a relatively unknown cult that had appeared as if from nowhere in Central Oregon in the 1980s. To locals, Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh and his followers seemed to have appeared from nowhere in 1981. They had rapidly built a small town for themselves, complete with its own airport and fire department. Unlike other cults, the Rajneeshis, as they were called, embraced material goods and free love. It attracted college-educated progressives and was at odds with the more conservative ranchers from nearby Antelope. One of Wild Wild Country's biggest draws is the way it reveals the cult story. The viewer is initially shown the bright side of Rajneeshpuram, the cult's town. Over the opening episodes, the Rajneesh's teachings are explored in interviews with his personal secretary, Ma Anand Sheila, draw you in. However, as was the case for many unsuspecting people drawn in by Rajneesh in real life, the viewer soon realizes this free-loving utopia is only on the surface. After many disputes with neighboring antelope, Rajneesh Puram residents would do anything to make sure a candidate friendly to their way of life won the county elections, including committing the first and biggest bioterror attack on American soil when they poisoned hundreds of people with salmonella. Homeless people were brought into the town and made to vote for a Rajneeshi friendly candidate, but once they were of no more use, many were sedated and shipped off to neighboring towns away from where they had been picked up. 
Possibly the scariest part of Wild Wild Country is that initial draw of the cult, especially for younger audiences who may not have been familiar with the cult before the documentary. The attractive messages portrayed in the opening episodes could make some question their initial suspicions. Once the true horrors the cult committed are revealed, anybody even slightly drawn in by the stories from earlier episodes are left questioning whether they could be drawn in by a similar cult in real life. Number 3 The Keepers is a disturbing story of the cover-up of the systematic abuse at one Baltimore Catholic school and the links the people in power would go to to keep their crimes a secret. Sister Kathy Sesnick was an English teacher and drama teacher at the all-girls Archbishop Keough School when she went missing in 1969. Two months later, her body was found near a garbage dump in a local suburb. The nun's murder remains unsolved, though there have been plenty of accusations in the decades since her death. Documentary maker Ryan White set out to create another feature like his previous work, The Making of a Murderer. But the more research he did, the more he discovered this wasn't the case for a simple whodunit documentary. The story wasn't about Sister Kathy's murder. That was only one part. Most people today know the endemic abuse discovered within the Catholic Church around the world throughout its history, but it's harder to believe something so big would happen within one's own community. The Keepers is just one story that shows how easy it was for abuse to be covered up by the authorities, and how we can never know what secrets people may be being forced to keep. Father Joseph Mescal was a counselor at the school and alleged to be involved in the abuse of many of the pupils he was supposed to be looking after. Maskell wasn't alone in his abuse, and it's alleged a number of people, including the police, were involved and helped to cover it up. Many of the victims confided in Sister Kathy, who was a young woman popular with the students. It's alleged she confronted Maskell about the abuse, and it ultimately cost her her life. The Keepers allows Maskell's victims to tell their story, both of their abuse and their lives afterward. Ryan White interviewed dozens of students who lived through the abuse, five of whom appear on camera to tell the secrets they were forced to keep for almost 50 years. Maskell himself will never face justice for his actions. He passed away in 2001. Even before this, his victims were denied justice when a lawsuit against him and others in 1995 was thrown out of court due to the statute of limitations. However, the chilling documentary brought to light just how far corruption could go and hopefully will shed light on other cases around the world. Number 2 Dead Man's Line tells a story that wouldn't have been out of place in a Hollywood action thriller movie, but it also takes a look at victim blaming and how the media turned a man who held a shotgun to another man's head into a folk hero. Tony Curitus had taken out a loan of $100,000 from Meridian Mortgage to develop 17 acres of land. He hoped to sell the land to a chain store or convert it into a strip mall. However, Kiritis struggled to find a buyer for the land, which led him to struggle to pay back the loan. He vested the Meridian Mortgage offices many times. Sometimes he sought advice, and sometimes the confrontations were more violent. He was convinced M. L. Hall, the business owner, wanted the land for himself. When he arrived at the office on February 8, 1977, he'd reached the end of his rope. Hall Sr. was away on holiday at the time, so Curtis took his son, Richard Hall, hostage. He wired the muzzle of a sawn-off shotgun to the back of Richard's head. If police shot him, the gun would be fired. If Richard tried to escape, the gun would also be fired. For 63 hours, Richard was held hostage. The media followed every twist of the story, cameras literally following Curtis as he took Richard to a police car and made him drive to an apartment. 
Dead Man's Line takes viewers back to those tension-filled days with footage from the news crews that covered the story as police and representatives from Meridian Mortgage tried to negotiate with Curitas. The documentary was also a chance for Richard to tell his story. Curitas eventually let Richard go after being assured he wouldn't be arrested. Of course, he was immediately arrested, but was found not guilty by reason of insanity after a short trial, which was celebrated by many who saw him as a hero for standing up to mortgage brokers. Richard stayed out of the limelight for more than 40 years before finally coming forward to tell his side of the story. Dead Man's Line is an insight into the mind of a man who thought he was going to be killed. Number 1 Apologies for the bad pronunciations that are likely about to follow, but the disappearance of Gudmundur Inarsen and Girfinur Inarsen was just the beginning of the story in the documentary Out of Thin Air. The two unrelated men went missing 10 months apart in Iceland in 1974. Despite there being no bodies, evidence, or witnesses, six people were convicted for their involvement in the murders. The conviction rested solely on their later retracted confessions. Memory Distrust Syndrome is a mental condition where people develop profound mistrust of their own memories. They rely on others to help them either accept their memory as truth or fill them in on things they should remember. Out of Thin Air explores the consequences of the syndrome, which combined with isolation and mental torture techniques, led to the wrongful convictions and a miscarriage of justice. Police were under pressure to solve the disappearances of the two Inarsen men. When Gudmundur, a young laborer, went missing during a snowstorm after drinking at a club, there was no cause for suspicion. It was assumed he must have died from hypothermia after getting lost. But when Girfinur went missing, there were clear signs of foul play. He received a phone call from an unknown man at a local harbor cafe at around 10.20 p.m. He left telling nobody where he was going or why. His car was later discovered near the same cafe. Police connected the two cases, although the reason why remains unclear. However, there was no evidence, bodies, or leads, and the case quickly went cold. This changed two years later. While investigating an unrelated fraud case, police showed 20-year-old Erla a picture of Gudmundar. She told them she recognized him from a party she'd been at a few years earlier. She claimed that on the night Gudmundar went missing, she had a nightmare about the father of her newborn baby and his friends talking about killing him. Police believed this may have been a repressed memory. They constructed a story tying Erla, her boyfriend, and four others to Gudmundar's murder and Girfinur. After months of solitary confinement, water torture, and sleep deprivation, the six suspects confessed. However, even as they signed the confessions, the suspects were unsure of their own memories. Some tried to retract the confessions in court, but attempts were denied. It wasn't until the so-called ring leader died in 2011 and his personal diaries were made public that the case was reopened. The five men convicted were acquitted in 2018. Erla is still fighting to overturn her conviction. Out of Thin Air is a chilling story that makes you ask if you can trust your own memory. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you like this video, be sure to click that like button. Also, don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell to keep up to date with all of our future uploads. But I've been Ty Knotts and I'll catch you guys in the next video.